Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day. Today we're going to be continuing our study in Exodus 29 and through chapter 30 and 31 as well. But before we do that, let's go ahead and pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, I lift up this time to you, Lord. I claim that promise that your word does not return void, but will accomplish its purpose. Lord, I just ask you to open our eyes, open our ears, open our heart, that we will understand. And Lord, I just ask you to be with each prayer request that's out there, people who are suffering, people who are ill, people, Lord, that have lost loved ones, and those who are carrying special burdens and heavy burdens. I lift them up to you, Lord, and I just ask for your intervention, Lord, and I ask you, Lord, that you would just be with each person and speak to them today. I ask for a special word for each person, and I ask, Lord, that your gospel will spread and we will see a great move of God, that your Holy Spirit will, will just move among us. Lord, we honor you, we praise you, we give glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, today we're going to be starting, we didn't quite finish Exodus 29, but we're going to be starting in verse 38 of 29. Uh, last week we talked about the altar and how the bull was to be sacrificed every seven days. If you go back two verses, it says, Seven days you will make atonement for the altar and sanctify it. And the altar shall be most holy. Whoever touches the altar must be holy. I wanted to read that just to give you the feeling of the holiness of God and the sanctifying and how everything's sanctified by the blood. Um, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And then in verse 38, it goes over the daily offerings. It says, Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour, mixed with one-fourth a hen of pressed oil, and one-fourth a hen of wine as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. You shall offer it with a grain offering and a drink offering, as in the morning, for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This is a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you and I will speak to you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priest and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt and I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So this is finishing the consecration of the priest and the preparation for the people and the tabernacle to be prepared for God's service. But he said it's for glory and beauty and he also mentioned that it is so they would know that he is the Lord. All of these things are done so they will know who the Lord is and that, that, that Aaron and his sons will come to fear God. And all these things were done so they may know God. But also, I also want you to, to look at these two lambs. Every day they were to sacrifice a lamb in the morning and one at twilight or in the evening. And just looking at this, uh, first, you know, it's not nothing in the Bible is by coincidence. God puts it in there for a reason. It says that the lamb is to be mixed with a mixture of flour, ephah flour, a hen of a fourth of a hen of oil, and a fourth of a hen of wine. And I just couldn't help but think of the fact that flour is bread, and and that that this represents the word of God, and then the oil represents the Holy Spirit, the special anointing of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the wine represents the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But these three go together, and they mix with the lamb, the sacrificed lamb, to make this a perfect sacrifice, and one that is a sweet aroma to God, a pleasing favor. And he says, there will I meet you. I will meet you at the tabernacle of meeting as we meet. But there's more things I want to say about having fellowship with God because of these things. And of course, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and, and because of His sacrifice, it makes it possible. 
But I also want to look, and it also said that was for a generation, forever. But I want to look at a couple of Psalms because it talks about morning and evening. It says, blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And, and here it says in verse two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. Christianity is not a religion, it's a way of life. And it's a relationship with God. And it should be through, throughout the whole day, beginning in the morning and ending in the evening, we're to have this relationship. It says meditate on the word of God day and night. Psalm 55, 16 and 17 says, As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. There's no time God doesn't hear you. He's available 24 hours a day. You can pray in the morning, you can pray in the evening, you can pray at noontime, but we should pray without ceasing, always having that attitude of prayer to where we can pray at any time. But we need to start the day with God and end the day with God. It's so important we understand this concept. And then Psalm 113, two and three. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name be praised. From the time we get up to the time we end, may God be praised. This is the Lord's day. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Every day is the Lord's day. And it's a day we can have fellowship. We're so blessed we don't just have to go to church to have fellowship with God. We can do it every day that we have fellowship with God. Going to church is so special. And it's such a great thing that we, we assemble together and worship together. But every single day we can have this fellowship with God. And it's such a blessing. And I just wanted to share that before we get into chapter 30. More articles uh, involved with the tabernacle. And each one has special meaning. First one we're going to talk about is the altar of incense, which was right before the veil. It's in the same holy place where you have the golden lampstand and the table of showbread before the Ark of the Covenant on the other side of the veil. But this altar of incense is right by the veil, which is important uh, as you enter into the veil. Chapter 30. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square. And two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. You shall overlay the top. Its top, its sounds all around and its horns with pure gold. Like, like the other furniture, it's, it's, it's special. It's best material. And you shall make it for a molding of gold all around. The two gold rings you shall make under it, for it, under the molding on the top, both of its sides. You shall place them in the two sides, and they shall be holders of the poles for which it, to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil, which is the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. This is like right before you meet with God and going into the presence of God. It's a special location. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it. They're always to be burning when they're ministering in here. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. In other words, when he says throughout the generations or for your generations forever, he means this is a statute. This is a, a shadow of things to come that it always applies forever. And it has purpose now as much as it did then. You shall not offer strange incense on it. This is important. Or a burnt offering or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of a sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. First, you have to atone for it. Every year they're to take the blood of the sacrifice of the sin offering, apply it to the horns of this, because everything is sanctified by blood, and it's holy before God. When you look at this, Jesus' blood shed for our sins is so critical to our faith. <laughs> 
and it touches everything and it affects everything. But this makes it holy. That's what makes this so special in God's eyes is that it's holy. But it's only to do incense and they're warned not to do it wrong. Do not bring strange fire before God. And I want to look at a couple of things in Scripture related to this. One thing is when you burn incense on this altar, the person doesn't go beyond the veil except once a year on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for the people and himself. But the altar, the incense and the aroma, it goes beyond the veil. It goes past the veil into the presence of God. So it's like it's a communication between the two. It's a way of talking. It's like prayer, and I'll talk about that in a minute, how special that is, that it goes to the very throne of God as we worship. And, but we also have to look at the warning. Do not offer unauthorized incense. There's a sad testimony of two of Aaron's sons who did this. It's in Leviticus 10, 1 through 2. It says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. What a warning. Two of Aaron's sons, it cost their lives because they, they didn't listen to God's command. They did something wrong, not the way they should have done it. And, and they knew what they were doing, but they took it lightly. They took this, this service of God lightly. But it isn't to be taken lightly. It's, it's a relationship with God. And it's so important we understand that. But let's look at more of the reason for this altar. It all circles on prayer and on praise and worship. You know, you've got the table of showbread representing the Word of God, and you have the golden lampstand representing the, the Holy Spirit inside of us that lets our light shine. But also to get into the presence of God, you need prayer and worship. God inhabits the praises of His people. And this is like the sweet incense before God, a sweet aroma, and it's a holy place. When you meet with God, that's holy. And I wanna give you a couple of scriptures Psalm 141, 2. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let it be sweet incense to you, Lord. Let it be a sweet aroma the time we spend together in prayer. Morning and evening, it's to be all times that I spend time. That is a special anointed time with God. And we should not take that for granted and realize how special that is. And then in Revelation, the throne room. I want you to see how God views your prayers. Revelation 5, 8 and 9. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You are worthy to be praised. You're worthy of our praise and worship. God inhabits the praises of his people. He's home there. He enjoys worship. He enjoys worship, but it's good for us. And that's how you enter the presence of God, but you touch the throne room. It says it's like incense, that God smells it. It's like a continual sweet aroma before him. God remembers your prayer. It's always there. And it goes to the very throne of God. And that's this altar of incense right before the veil to reach into the kingdom of God to the very throne room. Such a special part of, of ministry and such a special part of our relationship with God. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer and touching the very heart of God. It is sweet aroma to Him. Okay, the next part. This is a neat part. The ransom money or the census tax. Half a shekel. Verse 11, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, that there may be no plague among you when you number them. Now, why did he mention the plague for a census? 
twice in Scripture. David did it once, and they did it again in Numbers, where they took a census, but it wasn't authorized by God. But a census has a tendency to puff you up and make you think you did something, or you're doing something right. Look at our numbers. They're really growing. Look how strong our army we had. And, and God realized they were taking pride in that as opposed to realizing that it was the blessing of God that made that happen. And I'll come back to that in a second. But this is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give, one half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras, if that helps you understand it. A gera must be small if it's one twentieth of a shekel. A half shekel shall be offered to the Lord. This is interesting. Everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When you give an offering to the Lord and make to make atonement for yourselves. So this was a different than a free will offering or a giving of the people. Generally, those who had more money were able to give more free will offering. But this, everybody paid the same price. Everybody had to pay it. And a half shekel is not a lot in terms of a yearly payment, maybe two days wage, but it's, but it's still not a heavy load on the poor. But everybody paid the same, the same debt they owe God. It's ransom money. It's a redemption money or atonement money. And you shall take the atonement money for the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Basically, when you look at this um, census tax, everybody paid the same, and it was called redemption money. Because if you think about it, Jesus paid the same price for all of us, and it cost us all the same. We owe God the same debt. So what this was was when a census was taken, that they were reminded to bring this half shekel before God to realize that the glory goes to God, that he's the reason we have this, that he's the reason all our blessings. And it was also called later a temple tax. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's to give glory to God, but it's appointed for the service of the tabernacle. There's a couple of examples in Old and New Testament. Um, in Exodus 38, it mentions this temple tax being used for the building of the tabernacle. It mentions in 2 Kings 12 about how they use this temple tax to help pay for repairs of the tabernacle or the temple. And, uh, and even Jesus, they referred to it. Uh, well, Numbers, it talks about uh, Nehemiah, how he reinstituted the temple tax. So it was important as, as for, for us to understand that redemption comes from God. It's an atonement from God. And I'm going to share an example in the New Testament in just a second. When you look at this census or temple tax, and I just felt led to share scriptures here because they speak for themselves. Matthew 17, 25 through 26. What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, from strangers. Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. And just to set the stage, this is when they complained to Peter that and the disciples, does your master not pay the temple tax, the required temple tax or tax that was required? And that's when Jesus asked this question, who should pay it? And Peter, of course, said, well, strangers. He said, then the children are free. But see, Jesus didn't have to pay redemption money because he was the redeemer. <laughs> but yet to pay it, they went ahead and went and told Peter to go get a tax to not offend out of a fish's mouth, enough to pay for him and Peter. So you see, Jesus even referred to this temple tax, but it, it, he said the children are free because he paid our ransom. He paid our redemption. And that's what this is all about because he is the redeemer and we're children of God as believers. Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many but he paid with his life. He paid that redemption money. He paid it for you. And that's what it's talking about. Ephesians 1, 7. There were so many good scriptures. In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. In him we are redeemed by his blood. We, he paid a price. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, and I know you're familiar with this beautiful verse. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the aimless conduct received by the tradition of men, by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. You were not redeemed with silver and gold like the temple tax. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus as a lamb without spot and without blemish. 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Glorify God because you were bought with a price. There was a ransom paid. <laughs> and it was paid by Jesus as he paid the ransom money. The census tax, the ransom money. The next thing we're going to talk about is the bronze laver. The bronze laver, it's going to say, is between the altar and the tent of meeting. In verse 17, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze, for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet and water from it. When you go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, you shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. The brazen or bronze laver. This bronze was like a shiny bronze that you could see your own reflection in. In fact, they used this a lot for mirrors back then. But you could see your reflection, and then the water was for washing. But being between the altar and the tent of meeting, for you to wash and to you to be prepared for the service of God, you have to face the altar first. You have to be sanctified. You have to know the Lord and have that relationship with Him. And then you can wash for the service. We all to have clean hands and clean feet, it talks about. It was for the priest to wash and before they put on their garments, but also to prepare them to go into the tent of meeting, to realize that this is holy to God, that we should all wash. And then it says, you can see your reflection. You see who you are before God. And there's so many, if, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us for all unrighteousness. Even as a believer, once you, you accepted Christ on the altar on the cross and you've accepted him as Savior, we still need to wash our hands and feet. In fact, Jesus referred to this in the Lord's Supper where he said, Jesus said, he who bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Referring to the fact that through life, we need to wash our hands and feet, but you have to be clean on the inside first to do that. Psalm 23, 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, the bronze laver, a place where you meet God, you, uh, you look at yourself, and you confess your sins before God, and you have a clean heart. And you know, it just keeps you in a right relationship to God as you prepare for service. The holy anointing oil and the incense. This is verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. And you shall make these from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment com compounded according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. 
So this had special ingredients that God put in that a perfumer would put all these together to make a special anointing oil that God said was holy before him. With it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony, the table and its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of the burnt offering with all its utensils, the laver and its base, and you shall consecrate them, and they, they shall be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them, that they may minister to me as priest. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This is the holy anointing oil to me throughout the generations. It shall not, it shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you use it like any others, according to its composition. It is holy, and it is to be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, and whoever puts any of it to an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. Basically, this is a special anointing from God. They anointed the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant. They anointed the table of showbread, the, the, the uh, candlestick, the, the altar of incense, the bronze altar, the bronze laver. Every utensil was anointed with this anointing oil included with the special sanctification from the blood from the altar. But this anointing is a God thing. It's like we all need to be anointed by God for his service. And we have to realize it's from God. This is a special anointing oil. And it's something special. When you're anointed by God, it's special. When you're given a word of God to share, it's special. When you share the word of God, it's special. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. When you meet with God and you pray, it's special. It's anointed. God touches everything and makes it holy. But you have to realize that it comes from God. That's why it wasn't to be done in any normal purposes, but only for the work of the ministry. And because the Aaron and his sons were to do the work of the ministry, they were anointed because they were called by God to do that specific service. But we have to realize as children of God, that anointing is something so special. The incense. Verse 34, And the Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, stuck in Ankya and Galbamim, and pure frankincense, and these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony of the tabernacle of meeting, where I will meet you. It shall be most holy to you. And as for the incense you shall make, you shall not make it for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any of it, to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. So it talks about how special this incense is too for the, for the altar of incense. You know, it's interesting, it had frankincense in it and the holy anointing oil had myrrh in it, two of the gifts given to Jesus by the wise men, by the Magi. And they were wise indeed to give these gifts because he is the anointing. He is the one that gives that special gift and God knows how to mix things. Even the burial, even the death and resurrection of Christ, how it mixes with everything to make everything special. Give that special anointing and he is our great high priest like frankincense to make it special. But one thing I wanted to point out, it says it's most holy. And we're to not take that for granted, the anointing from God. But it says it's to be seasoned with salt, pure and holy. Everything needs to be seasoned with salt. You are the salt of the earth. If the salt's lost its flavor, what good is it? But God wants everything to be seasoned to where other people can enjoy it and other people can see your, your, your life in Christ and know that they want that, that it brings them to Christ. Luke 4, 18 through 19. And this is Jesus speaking when he began his public ministry in Nazareth at the temple. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed or set the captives free, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He says, the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel, seasoned with salt. He is the light of the world, but he has been anointed to do the work of the ministry and he anoints us to do the work of the ministry. 
but it comes from God. It's a special anointing from Him. He is the anointed one. And we need to understand how important that is. And uh, I'm going to go to Exodus 31. And this is a short chapter, but it, it kind of follows all this up. Chapter 31. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, and cutting jewels for the setting and carving wood and the work of all manner of workmanship. And I indeed, I have appointed with him Oliab, the son of Ameshach, the, of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the hearts of the gifted artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of the burnt offering and all the utensils, and the laver and its base, the garments of the ministry and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons and ministered as priest and the anointing oil and the sweet incense in the holy place according to all that I've commanded you shall they do. The problem with getting this, this instruction from God and this plan with all these intricate details and all this artistry needed to build all these articles of God to have the cherubim included and, and the artistic work and the special instructions. God gifted people. He mentions two people in particular that were specially gifted in artistry and craftsmanship. That God had filled them with the spirit, with this ability to do this. But it also says others were given this artistic ability. So others helped, but God called people and he gave them the abilities to do this. But let me tell you something, when you're doing the work from God, you need to be anointed and you need to have a special touch from God to realize this is holy before God. And you take pride in your work, pride for God, that, that you want it to be the best. You want to give your best to God. But God gifted people to be able to do all the work for all these things and as part of the tabernacle. Even the utensils were specially made under God's design, but God gifted man to be able to do these things. And God gives people in the church today to do different things that we all fit together as one piece. And we're all an important part in different parts, but we make up the body of Christ. And, and we are the body of Christ. And then he talks finally in chapter 31 about the Sabbath law. And Moses is finishing his 40 days with God. None of this has been built yet. It's all a plan. But God says, I'm going to provide people to do this. A lot of times people go into this, they said, who's going to do this? But God provides. Even with the giving, God has a way of providing, putting it on people's hearts to give. The Sabbath law. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. It shall be a time sign between you and me throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore let it be holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall be surely put to death. For whoever does not work on it, that person shall be cut off from them among the people. Work shall be done for six days, and the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, and observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in it six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. The Sabbath, we talked about it already. God made Sabbath for the man because he knew we needed it. We needed a day of rest. But basically what he's saying, and, and uh, later people took this out of context where they said you can't do anything. You can't go take care of your sheep. You can't pull them out of a ditch and all these things. 
you can't wash your hands. I mean, there's, there's so many things and traditions they added. But Jesus said, it's okay to do good. What God's saying is take time for God. Don't just do your normal everyday work and your everyday work, but give God the best. It is okay to do good on the Sabbath, but we need to take time for God and realize we need to make special time available for God. The Lord's day, spend time with God. It is special. It's a special anointing. It's a special time you have with him. So Moses got all these instructions. He's coming down with the mountain, but he has something very precious in his hands. It says he had the two tablets of stone written by the finger of God, the Ten Commandments as we know them, and they were written by God. <laughs> you know, it talks in the Bible about how that our sin is written with a, a pen of iron with, um, that, that has a diamond tip engraved on our heart like our sin is engraved, but only God can break that. But God writes on stone and he can change the hardest heart that God can release us and break the bonds and the chains. But God writes on tablets of stone. <laughs> it's so special. And as we get to this point, Moses is on a high. But next week as we, dis we discuss, we're going to see what the people are doing and it's not good. The golden calf next week. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the tabernacle and all the meanings and all the intricate details that mean something about our relationship with you. Thank you for dying for us and being that Lamb of God. You are worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen.